Welcome to Following, a weekly podcast where we will discuss how to follow Jesus. Christianity is not an event you attend, it's a life you live. Join us each week as we dive into the intersection of real life circumstances and the life changing Word of God. Come, follow Jesus with us. John 10, 7 through 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, welcome back to following. Uh, We've had, we've had some, some trouble getting this episode off the ground, Uh, but that's okay. Perhaps if you hadn't made fun of me for my lack of rapport in the conversation, you would be having some technological difficulties. That's what the people are saying, Phil. Oh, that's right. The people want more rapport. (laughs) Uh, So anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris Stoner. I'm here uh, with my good friend and pastor, Phil Bray. Phil, say hi to the people. Hey, everybody. Glad you're back. Yeah, and, and we're, we're also here uh, with a special treat, joined by another one of our pastors, Pastor Andy Brown. So, uh, Andy, say, say hello. Hey, everybody. Long-time listener, first-time joiner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have Andy on uh, today because he, he actually preached this, this passage, uh, moving along in the I Am series, talking mm-hmm. about uh, Jesus uh, declaring to be God through uh, different phrases like, I'm the bread of life, I'm the, the door, I'm, I'm the light of the world. Uh, and and then this morning we're looking at uh, what what was that John John ten seven through ten yeah seven mm-hmm. through yeah so uh, Andy why, why don't I just hand it off to you and you just kind of give us a, a quick recap of of what is the the point of this text what is Jesus doing with a passage like this yeah so the short version is that Jesus is drawing on some first uh, century imagery of a sheepfold uh, which is going to be a low stone wall. Uh, with one opening in it, and the sheep would go into the sheepfold at night for mm-hmm. safety reasons. The shepherd would position himself at the opening uh, and do the protecting over the sheep while they were in the sheepfold. Uh, so when Jesus says, I am the door, he's expecting his audience to have that picture in mind. And based on what we've got here in the text, there are four proofs that Jesus gave that he is the Son of God, so that we will trust him fully and in all things. The first is that he is the true prophesied Messiah. There were a lot of false messiahs that came before Jesus uh, that tried to draw people away, uh, but Jesus says specifically, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. That would be the false messiahs, but the sheep did not listen to them. So the true mm-hmm. people of God were not deceived by the false messiahs. They instead recognized the true one. Uh, so that's a proof that he is the son of God as he claimed to be. The second point was that Jesus, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot the second point to my own sermon. (laughs) Yeah, he proves he's Uh, Son of God because he provides salvation salvation, to those who place their faith in him. Thank you. So Jesus provides salvation to those who place their faith in him. This imagery of a door is used as a metaphor for salvation throughout the entirety of the New Testament, um, from Matthew all the way to Revelation, and that's not a euphemism on my part. That's that's actually literally the case. Matthew chapter 7, where he says, strive to enter by the narrow gate, mm-hmm. or uh, Luke 13, uh, where he tells the man to enter through the narrow door, all the way to Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, this is a very common theme, and, and I think that when we see it metaphorically used here, that it's used enough that we can say that this is a technical uh, technical use of the imagery that is done by the by the Bible. Yeah. So the the Jesus says uh, if you enter the door he will be saved. That's in verse 9 of John chapter 10. That's that's about as straightforward as it gets, right? Yeah. So the third point here is that Jesus proves he is the son of God because he secures and protects his people uh that uh, from others that would do them harm. Uh, this is the whole point of the sheepfold itself, is that it is a safe place. It is guarded by somebody who has a vested interest in the well-being and continued safety of the sheep. Uh, and that is the role that Jesus assumes, is, is a protector over his people. Because if 
he can save us, but if he doesn't protect us, then, you know, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Uh, so Jesus has to do both, and, and he does. That, that proves that he is the Son of God like he, like he says he is. Uh, then lastly, Jesus proves he is the Son of God because he provides abundant life to anyone who comes to him in faith. Uh, so the last verse here, verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not enough just to just to be alive. You have to have a life worth living, and Jesus is the one that gives us that. Uh, so we're, we're saved from our sins. Uh, we're protected from people that would seek to do us harm, but we're also saved to something worth having, and that's a life spent in perfect fellowship with God, which is the whole reason we were created in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was a great sermon, and uh, very thankful for for your preaching of it. And like any sermon, as you guys both know, you can't dig into every little area of application. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only so much you yeah. can cover. In a That's why this time. podcast exists. It's so That's that we right. can get into those weeds a little bit more. That's right. And so as I was listening yesterday, uh, when you were, when you were drilled into to point three there about Jesus protecting and securing his people from those who do them harm, um, I was, I was really wanting you to go more and, and, and obviously you couldn't, and so I thought, this, this is what we should talk about today, because I think a lot of people struggle. Um, Jesus says these things, mm-hmm. but they don't feel it at times. Mm-hmm. They, they don't feel protected. They don't feel secured. Uh, they feel like they're very much in danger. They feel like life is, is spinning chaotically out of control. Um, so, Andy, who, who would you say would be the chief harmer of God's people? Like, where does... Where does the the attack come from? Why do we feel the way we feel? Um, Why do we feel like we're always pushed back against the ropes, swinging? Yeah, the root of that activity is always going to be focused in what the Bible calls the accuser. That's this person that we call Satan, um, who started his journey by rejecting God and attempting to take God's place in heaven, as if he could ever do such a thing. Uh, Clearly, that didn't work out for him very well, uh, and he kind of took that personally, didn't he? Uh, And that's been what's been going on ever since. Uh, And the reason that he hates us, not just Christians, I mean mean humanity in general, um, like I said in the sermon yesterday, we are made in God's image. Every single time he Mm -hmm. looks at any person on planet Earth, he sees a little picture of God, and that just reminds him (coughs) that he lost his heavenly battle and has been cast down to this Earth. He can never be what he sees, and that just drives him crazy. Yeah, Yeah. I I thought that was a great point um, when you made about the the image bearers and how that, that hatred stemming from his hatred of God, uh, and we remind him of, of the Lord in mm-hmm. that regard. Um, let's talk about what, what it looks like for Satan to attack. Because um, you, you mentioned that he is the accuser. Uh, I think that there's a, a, in Revelation 12, he's referred to as the accuser of our brethren. And so one of his chief modes of attack for believers is constant accusation, mm-hmm. constant mm-hmm whispering in your ear and yeah. literally voices in your head telling you that you're a wretch, a worm, a despicable person. No mm-hmm. one loves you. No one cares about you. God hates you. You're a terrible Christian. You should just go kill yourself. I mean, those, those kind of thoughts, uh, especially when they're uttered in the second person in your brain, mm-hmm. uh, are demonic mm-hmm. and they're devilish. And, uh, and I don't think people realize how much they are beset by that kind of an attack as they are. Um, so I, I think that's one way. Um, what's, what's another way that you think that Satan attacks the believer? Yeah, so I think the normal thing that we would think of is through temptation. Uh, yeah, Satan absolutely. is very good at providing us with temptations that are seemingly uniquely suited to our predispositions, uh, which because they are. Satan is very smart, uh, and he has a lot of power in this world. The Bible is very clear that he is the prince of the power of the air. Mm-hmm. Uh, this earth is his domain. Uh, I think a lot of people get the wrong idea about Satan being like the king of hell. Uh, That's not accurate at all. Hell is not Satan's domain. Hell is Satan's punishment. Satan's domain is the earth right now. So his control over it can extend to some of the ways that he influences us in our decision making. So the first thought that I have is just to see, you know, when when, uh, Satan... uh, tempts Jesus in Luke chapter 4, he does so in three ways, at least three ways that are uh, that are provided here in Luke. 
The first is to to tell him in verse 6 of chapter 4, To you I will give all this authority in their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Hmm. Uh, and Jesus answers, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Um, so he's trying to to get Jesus to look at something and to want it so badly that he will do anything to have it. This is what I think would be considered the lust of the eyes. So this thing is so desirable to me that I will compromise my integrity in order to, to get it. Uh, the second way that he, he, uh, he attacks Jesus or tempts Jesus is uh, to say, uh, to go up to the, the tall uh, temple and to throw yourself down from here, for it is written, and here he quotes the Bible, and he quotes it accurately, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So he's trying to trick us, or he's trying to trick Jesus into believing something false about God's word so that he will make a mistake. And Jesus says, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Um, so again, Jesus responds with an accurate interpretation of Scripture, but it sure looks like uh, like like Satan is trying to get Jesus to attempt something that would be prideful, uh, to say, well, nothing's going to happen to you because you're so important, mm. and wh- so why don't you just do something foolish to show how important you are? And that, that seems to be a, a pride issue. And then, uh, uh, I think I may have gotten the order backwards. Well, there's that, that similar, similar trope in, in the Genesis story where... when. Mm. You know, the Satan Satan comes to Eve and says, "Did God really say?" Yes, uh, and and offers her a different interpretation of what God said. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting in, in in what you're talking about, Andy and Chris, is that his his objective is destruction. He wants to destroy us, whether that's through self destruction because of accusation to the point where we can't take it anymore and we just kill ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, or through the deception which he is also called the deceiver of the whole world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think his work of temptation is in this area of deception where he deceives and tricks people into abandoning the light for the darkness and abandoning food for poison, uh, abandoning fresh water for salt water. And just like he told Eve, you won't die. He's deceiving her. He's lying to her mm-hmm. in order for her to get her, to persuade her to to disobey God, which is going to bring about her destruction. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to keep in mind here, the way that he seeks to attack, the way that he seeks to harm, his goal is destruction. And if he can destroy us through the barrage of mental accusation, or if he can destroy us through temptation, which leads us away from the Lord and brings about all kinds Which of Which I think he then uses later to accuse us and make yeah, us yeah, feel bad. I was about like, to say that. It's like this, mm-hmm. this circular... Yeah, yeah. He's, he's thinking several steps ahead here. Yeah, this yeah. is a crafty guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, another, another way that I think he uses, or that he attacks, is by using people to attack people. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Um, well, the, I remember many, many years ago, I was discouraged and uh, in the ministry and tired and, and beat up. And uh, I just sat down and I started reading through the pastoral letters, which is First, Second Timothy and Titus. And the Lord was so good and encouraging during that time. But one of the verses that really stuck out to me was in chapter, was in Second Timothy 2, verse 24. It says, And the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, Mm. and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Mm -hmm. And and I think people sometimes don't realize, religious people don't realize that they are actually being held captive by Satan Mm. to do his will, causing division within the church, causing pain and heartache by accusing uh, by belittling, by destroying people um, with their words, with their actions, with their accusations, with their slander, uh, with their demeanor. You know, the, we, have to, we have to take a step back and think, are we exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit? Is what's coming out of my mouth and what's coming across as my demeanor, what's coming across from my actions, does it reflect the Spirit of God or does it reflect the character of the enemy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that, um, Andy, is, is, is kind of what he's describing, that type of person? Is that like the, the type of person that jumps the walls? You remember you talked in it your sermon, like, like there's one door that you can enter through, and that door is, is Christ, obviously, but there's people who 
try to enter by other means, only to do what? To, to steal and to rob, uh, uh, to be thieves. Um, and so is, is that kind of what, what you're talking about? Like yep, those people absolutely. that come in to accuse and destroy and steal yep. this unity, to steal joy? Um, yeah, there, there's, all, there's lots of people who claim to follow Jesus, and there have been throughout history, but who do more destruction than they do good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, even to the point of literal murder. I mean, where you mm-hmm. had the church burning other people at the stake. Um, uh, horrible things yeah. throughout church history yeah. done in the name of Jesus. For printing the Bible. Yeah, uh, just absolutely insane. So um, I think what you, what you see here is Satan attacks, and sometimes he uses, sometimes it's a direct attack, sometimes he uses his demon lackeys, and sometimes he uses people whom he, who he has captive against their will, and they don't even realize it. Yeah. Um, but that brings me back to, to Andy. Like this, this point is that as the door, Jesus keeps out or he, he secures and protects those enemies. Um, how, does that, how does he do that if we're still feeling that attack? It's very easy to get caught up in our feelings, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the difficulty is to understand that sometimes what we feel is not what's actually going on. And, and in some cases, our feelings actually are correct and they're accurate. And in that case, you know, what, what do we do? So I think what we need to do is to make sure that we focus on what is the kind of protection that Jesus is actually providing. Because if we expect something different or we project our own wants onto that activity, then of course we're going to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. So we need to take yeah. what's being offered and understand it correctly. So what what I wanted to make sure that I, I made clear in the sermon and the direction that I think we're headed here is that the kind of security Jesus is providing is the kind of security that actually really matters. Mm-hmm. And it's the eternal variety right. of security, right? Yeah. So there are a myriad of ways that your life will get objectively harder because you are a Christian. Yeah. It is very tempting to think that because Jesus is is God and God is all powerful, and you know once you're on Jesus's team, you're never going to lose a game ever again, right? Yeah. Um, you know if if Jesus was the captain of your basketball team, you guys would win two hundred to twelve every single time you step on the court. That's just not the way that works, right? right. So what we need to do is understand. Later in the in the passage, Jesus provides his own context, uh, and he says in verse twenty eight that I, no one will snatch them out of my hand. There is nothing anybody can do to remove you from heaven's role. Yeah. But what happens in the meantime is not always going to be to our liking. Yeah. But again, having a, a broader vision of what is going on here, it it may be entirely possible that God's plan and will for you is to suffer in a given situation because to do so will achieve a greater result later, or it brings him glory in some way that he would not be able to enjoy otherwise. And that is the whole point of our lives, is to to reflect God's glory and character throughout all creation. So to say that that I, I feel like I'm being attacked, I feel like I'm, I'm enduring conflict, I feel like I'm suffering, you may actually be. Yeah. But first of all, that's not Jesus' fault. And second of all, this is, may be God's will for your life. And the thing that you must do is continue to conform yourself daily to the image of Jesus, mm-hmm. follow his will, uh, and, and do the job right. So that way, when you do see Jesus in heaven, you get told, well done, good and faithful servant. And that, that moment, I guarantee you, I, uh, that makes everything worth it. Paul, Paul uh, he categorizes this life as, or the, the struggles of this life as small momentary afflictions. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a guy who suffered. I mean, yeah. he was shipwrecked multiple times. He was almost stoned to death. He was thrown in jail. He was ultimately beheaded for his, his witness for Christ. And, and this guy is, is calling his time in jail a small momentary affliction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that, that really puts it into, into perspective. I think Paul had the right idea about what is Jesus protecting us from, and, and I think he understood that clearly. Let's, let's apply it in the area of accusations, because I think this is an area where a lot of people struggle, is this constant feeling of shame and guilt and unworthiness and I can't go pray to God because I've I've sinned again and I've asked him to forgive me for this sin 15,000 times mm-hmm. and I keep going back to it like a dog returning to its vomit. God has to be frustrated with me. God has to be angry with me and the enemy is pumping that into your brain as well. Like God doesn't love you. God is sick and tired of you. God's fed up with you. 
you're a terrible Christian, you know, it's those kind of thoughts. So how do you fight that with this idea that none, no one, not even the enemy can snatch you out of the father's hand? I think that there's a, there's a promise that he's making you there that you cannot be removed from his care, which means you cannot be removed from that group that's going to inherit eternal life when all things are made new. And I think the way that you combat the accusation and the despair and the discouragement that comes from that guilt and shame is like what he talks about in Ephesians 6. When in, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 there, he's talking about being strong in the Lord and putting on the armor of God in order that you may be able to stand firm against yes. the schemes of the devil. And one piece of armor that he particularly focuses on is the shield of faith. So the shield with which you deflect the flaming missiles of the enemy, mm -hmm. which I think are these accusations, accusations yeah. and temptations and deceits. How do, we, how do we guard ourselves, so to speak, to, from those accusations with the shield of faith? faith? Faith in what? I think faith in God's promises. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I had in my mind is what, what is the object of your faith? Because yeah. your faith is only as strong as, as right. the object that it represents. So... I, th I think you're exactly right. When when we start feeling those accusations and, and Satan starts coming after us, in, in some cases with what we know are actual legitimate accusations, like, you're right, I have messed up over and over again. And you're right, if somebody was in my position, I would probably think this person is not worth it. But guess what? We're not in God's position. Mm -hmm. And yeah. God is the object of our faith. It is the love of our Savior that yeah. sustains us in those instances. And the love of Jesus will never depart from the That's people right. that have placed their faith in him. So it's all well and good for Satan to come and, and to prey upon our feelings and upon our expectations and maybe even in some cases our realizations. But at the same time, he will never be able to remove the love that Christ has for his people. That's right. And that's how we combat that is, is we we remind ourselves it, it is the Savior in whom I place my faith, and Jesus is stronger than Satan. We, yeah. We've seen the end of the story, right? Like, yeah. we've read our Bible through. We know how it ends. Right. And, it's, and it's the promise of forgiveness. He yes. says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, there's, there's two words there. He's faithful, which means he does what he says he'll do. Mm -hmm. So if we confess, he forgives. But he's just. He's just to do that. It's not unjust for God to yeah. forgive you again and again and again. Why? Because Jesus has already mm -hmm. paid for that mm -hmm. with his sacrifice. So going to verses like that and, and committing them to memory and having them in your heart and in your mind is what's going to enable you then to, to verbally trust those things. Lord, I, I am discouraged. I am in despair because you know, I'm feeling this way, but I know what you have said and what you have said is true. And you have promised me, and I thank you, God, for that. And I think if we can act our faith in those regards by intentionally going to those promises, you deflect the deceit. And mm -hmm. the same way with temptation. When temptation comes, it's telling you, you need this to be happy. You need this sexual relationship to be happy. You need this, this ladder of success to be fulfilled in life. Uh, and if you don't, you're not gonna you're not gonna be fulfilled. No, no, I do, I don't need that. I need Jesus, who is the treasure of my heart's mm -hmm. desire. He satisfies. He is the bread of life that satisfies. So I don't need that. If I have that, all well and good. If I don't have that, all well and good. I am content because I have Jesus. And I think reminding ourselves by promises that God has actually made to us, we deflect the attacks of the enemy. Yeah. Well, and and Jesus says in, in Matthew. Uh, it's, I think it's still in chapter ten. He says, "Don't fear the one that will, that can kill the body. Fear the one that will that that yeah. can destroy the soul." Uh, and so it's that that idea of of like you said, whether we have this or not, all is well. Uh, actually, it reminds me of that 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 song. Uh, it is well with my soul. Yeah. Um. And and it's not like this this, uh, you know, because of this, you should just go sell everything and 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 you know live. In poverty for the name of Jesus. I don't. I don't think that's. Yeah. That's what it. But but it, it is like all of this this material stuff. It, it does matter. But but in the, at the same time, it what really matters is Christ and having Christ. And so yeah. when Absolutely. when our faith is in Jesus and not in things of the world, like uh, like wealth, like fame, uh, like having uh, a certain partner or, or whatever, when when we place our faith in Christ for happiness, for sustenance, for being satisfied. 
yeah. uh, then we can we can face the the accuser and the, the, those who would oppose Christ. Yeah. Uh, and whenever accusations come our way, we stand firm, knowing that actually you're right in your accusations. I'm not good. I'm not. Uh, I'm I'm not holy. Uh, you're right. I did sin over and over, but you're wrong because. Christ has paid for those sins, yeah. uh, and and there's no there's no uh, what is what does it say in Romans? Uh, there is therefore no yeah, condemnation, no condemnation for, those, for those yeah. in Christ. Mm-hmm. That's a glorious text. Yeah, yeah. So so the 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 idea I think I think that we're talking about here is is our our defense for accusations from from the evil one from Satan yep. is placing our faith in these promises that that Jesus has given us that yep. uh, that He's paid for our sins that yep. that He. He's actually, like you said, faithful and just to forgive us. Uh, but, but even more than that, like in point four uh, of, of your sermon, giving the abundant life, like he's not going to just leave us there. He, that's, that's kind of the, the next step in this promise to, to hold us in this sheep pen or to protect us in the sheep pen, even whenever we come and go, uh, like, like sheep would, would come and go out mm-hmm. of the, the pen. He still protects us and he still takes care of us and provides for us. Yeah. And, and he leads us into to greener pastures, like it says in Psalms. Uh, well, twenty three. I, I think, um, Andy, something you said earlier make makes sense because I want to I want to pivot a little bit towards persecution and physical attack and and losing our lives for the yep. sake of the gospel. Um, you you mentioned having a false expectation of what that security and protection looks like, and sometimes I think the prosperity gospel has so infected the like a parasite the the church and especially in our country today. That there's this false expectation that if I'm right with God, then nothing mm. bad will happen to me. Um, but the reality is the New Testament tells us over and over and over and over and over to be prepared because we will suffer mm-hmm. and we're going to be killed for our faith. But that's not a denial of Jesus' protection. It's not a denial of, of, of the security that he provides. Why is that so? Because what happens here on this, well, we're, we're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic on this planet, right? Like this, yeah. everything's gonna gonna come to an end, and and probably pretty quickly. Uh, the the Bible has has told us to be ready for Jesus is coming, and and at that point, that's the end of human history. So, what what would you? I guess I would put this as a question: What would you rather be a part of? Would you rather have a wonderful life on a sinking ship, or would you rather have the smallest part of something that will last forever? Yeah. And w- when we look at it that way, I-, I think the answer is very obvious, and and clearly I'm I'm trying to move our focus towards heaven. So when people persecute us, um, like let's let's just take the the example of of religious persecution. Say there's somebody out there that uh, that believes a religion uh, in a in a way that says that uh, if if somebody denies the truth of what this religion says, that person uh, should not be permitted to live. Uh, clearly, we are going to run into conflict with that, right? Because we would say that that Jesus is the door, uh, and there is no other. So, if that comes to to persecution or even to outright martyrdom, we shouldn't expect that to, or we shouldn't say that that therefore Jesus isn't protecting us, because it is the witness that Jesus is worth dying for that makes martyrdom worthwhile in the first place, and other people are going to see that and say. If if this guy is willing to die for this, then that must mean it's really worth having. And all of a sudden, the gospel starts to spread. Yep. And this is the case throughout all of history. Uh, it is the times of most intense persecution that Christianity tends to grow the fastest. Yeah, well, it's 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 the origin story of the church. Like, Absolutely. In, in Acts, that's what the whole story yep. of Acts is telling There's us. There's a like statue the, of St. Bartholomew in Europe somewhere of him holding his skin. He was literally flayed yep. alive. And this statue commemorates that. And it, it has stood for centuries of, of this testimony of this man who was willing to let himself be cut into mm-hmm. pieces because Jesus was worth it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the Romans persecute the church in, in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. and so they're forced to leave. And you have the the Jew, the the uh, what is that? The starts with the D. Diaspora. Yeah, that that's the word. Uh, and and they 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 all flee and they go into different places. And what happens at those places that they go to? And this is the story of Acts. They plant churches. Yep. And and Christ's name is continued to preach in those places, and yeah. even more so from there. But how how do they do that? I think it's again through faith. Yeah. Christ. Like what he says in, in, in another I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Like mm-hmm. death is a curtain that you pass through now. It's not the final state. It is 
it's it's that which brings us into the presence of Jesus more fully than we are currently. It's why Paul says, "For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Mm. So when when we are martyred for our faith, it's not a bad thing in that regard. It's gain because it, it's ushering us into the presence of Jesus in paradise. Um, that doesn't and, and, mean that we should go seek. Martyr. No, I, I, <laughs> that, that, we, that we, is a camp we trust of Christianity. The, we have to trust the providence of yeah, God. Absolutely. Um, but I'm reminded too of Jim Elliot. I think I think I'm, I may get this a little bit garbled, but he said that he, you know, Jimmy Elliot was a, a missionary martyr uh, mm-hmm. to the Indians in South America, and he said he is no fool to sacrifice what I what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's that's so true. He understood rightly the perspective of heaven. Um, he understood Matthew 5, where Jesus said, Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hmm. So there's there, this idea of the, of the reward. It's even Jesus in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Right? So there's this idea that we are going to endure suffering, but the reward is so great. That the suffering is not even doesn't even measure on the yeah. on the scale of comparison, um, and I, I think it's confidence and faith that those promises are true that enable us to embrace whatever it is that God deems necessary in our lives. It requires a perspective that's larger than ourselves as well, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, if if all you are is focused on your own life and your own well-being and then bad things happen to you, then of course you're going to blame God for that, right? But if you see yourself as a part of a larger picture, that you you are a part of, of a movement that has literally survived for millennia throughout times of tribulation uh, and, and intense persecution, and in some cases even apathy, then you you play a part in advancing the kingdom of god either through your life or through your death and when you have that kind of grander perspective i think it's easier to say that it is well with my soul mm. when these bad things happen to me that that i can suffer without feeling like i'm being unprotected or that jesus doesn't care about me uh, because it is through my suffering that god's will is accomplished and he is glorified yeah. and and we it's it would be almost selfish it is selfish of us to to think otherwise that you know mm-hmm. god's highest priority is my personal happiness and well-being like a, how who who do you think you are sir mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. okay let's let, let's kind of wrap this episode up okay. uh, m- maybe what what is uh like an elevator pitch like we, we've been talking about this for for a while but now but like if you were to to nail down an elevator pitch a couple minutes uh some points that we can take away. Like, what am I supposed to do when when accusations come, when uh, persecution comes, when when I'm suffering, uh, when when the enemy is lying to me? What, what are we supposed to do very practically? So the practical uh, the practical ways that I would go is actually going to go back to something that that you had said, Chris, earlier about uh, standing firm, and that made me start thinking about well, what are we standing firm on? Yeah. And if we think back to the end of the Sermon on, on the Mount, uh, Jesus says, if you if you hear my words and do what I say to do, you're like a mm-hmm. wise man that has built his house on the rock, and and Jesus is is this rock. So the question is, are you actually standing firmly on Jesus? Uh, or to go back to the example of the sheepfold. Proximity to the shepherd is what gives you safety. So how close are you to Jesus? It's very easy to to start drifting away. You know, you, you know, you don't have to read your Bible this morning. I'll just do it later tonight. Uh, or you know, then it turns out you don't do it at all. Or your prayer life has begun to diminish. Or you've begun separating yourself from church. You're not going as often. Um, you're losing these spiritual disciplines in your life that keep you grounded on that rock of the Savior. And in that case, you are going to be vulnerable to Satan's attacks in those instances. So the right thing to do is to take stock of where you are in your spiritual walk. Are you walking in the power of of the Spirit, or are you walking in the power of your own flesh? Uh, Are you relying daily on the life-sustaining bread of God's Word? Are you communicating through prayer uh, to your Savior and to the Holy Spirit and to God the Father uh, and communicating with with Him that way? Are you fellowshipping with other believers that can help you in your spiritual walk and keep you grounded uh, in meaningful ways? If you're not doing these things, 
then yeah, it's you're probably going to have a hard time when trouble comes, and it is going to be easy to fall into those selfish patterns because we're all prone to them. Uh, but that's when I think we need that wake up call, and and we need to say, you know what, I do need to start doing a better job of reading and studying my Bible. I do need to to have an instinct to go to God first in prayer in all things. I do need to make a commitment to be a part of a local fellowship of believers, and and it's when we start to do those things that that our, our Christian walk, I think, really begins to flourish in ways that it probably had not before. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, a couple of things to, uh, before we, we close out the episode. One, I think you, that you were on like the, the Empire State Building elevator. Is, is that kind of what you had in mind? That's entirely possible. Okay. I mean, you know me, even <laughs> though our listeners might not. I If you tell me I have two minutes, ride. I'll take five. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, actually, three things. Secondly, you brought up standing on the rock and... and uh, just so you know, I had just gotten the VBS songs out of my mind, but yeah. no longer. Thank you for that, bringing yeah, this back. Yeah, that was in my mind too. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and okay, finally, uh, yeah, that, that's 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 a great point. And um, yeah, stand firm on on Christ. Yeah, uh, learn learn the promises. Yeah, yeah, and, and trust them. Uh, pray them. Read through the Psalms because th- that's what David mm-hmm. does. Is he he constantly he's mm-hmm. telling he's writing his his sorrows and his struggles, but then almost I mean. And a lot of the psalms that he writes at the end of the psalm is this resting and yeah. and and uh, joyous peace that's like yeah. the Lord is is my savior. He's yeah. you know he's he's providing and protecting. Yeah, uh, I I think it's I just, I just want to say this. I, there was a, not that long ago I suffered um, a very sub, I don't know if substantial is the right word, but a, an attack that was ongoing mm-hmm. for multiple nights. Uh, and I think it was of demonic origin. And the way that the way that the Lord brought me through that and out of that was through a particular promise in Deuteronomy. You know that that the Lord is with me. The mm. Lord has not abandoned me. Yeah. The Lord is mightier than those. And so for me, it was praying that promise in the night. It was praying that promise when I got up. It was praying that promise and thinking through that promise. And the Lord brought relief. Mm. So I, I think the the promises of Scripture are so very precious. We've got to learn them. And we've got to trust them actively uh, yeah. to stand firm against the enemy. Yeah, so, so become familiar with those promises. Memorize yes. them, uh, meditate on them, uh, and, and remember that we belong to the one that the enemy fears. Yes. Uh, and so we have nothing left to fear because of that, because he's stronger. He, he's the strong man. Um, so, yeah, with that, we'll, we'll close this episode out. Uh, thanks for, for joining us, Andy. It was a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you. I was very glad to be here. And, uh, yeah, and uh, until next week, keep following Jesus. Thanks again for tuning in to following. We truly hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. If you did enjoy this episode, we'd ask that you go ahead and hit that follow button and share this podcast with your friends and your family. If you'd like to hear more on this text, visit the link in the description and you can watch or listen to this sermon on this text. For more resources like this, go to hopeformacon.com. Until next week, keep following Jesus. Jesus.